Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I thank Tony for giving me this opportunity from TQIW for allowing me to give this talk. I hope I'm able to do some justice. From the cosmic waves that we have just seen for the last 90 minutes, let me take you to the brain. There's some technological issues, so pardon me if there will be a stuff get stuck somewhere. To be healthy as a whole, you need to have physical health as well as mental health. There has to be a combination of both, then only you can be called healthy. This is a definition which I read 35 years ago when I was an MBBS student. So we all have a mental health and it is how we relate to people, how we think, how we feel, how we interact with people. That's a little broad definition of mental health. Just as we can develop problems with the bodies, mental health also can cause problems. It has got various diverse manifestations. One in four people, that's what Samir said, he read when he was a student and so did I read and it remains the same. Anxiety and depression are very common. It affects all of us including myself, myself not excluded. Before an exam, tell me which parent has not been anxious and which child has not been anxious. Before an interview, which person is not anxious after losing a loved one who is not depressed? How many of us have seen our children who are abroad or who are studying somewhere be anxious? Is he on drugs? Is he taking alcohol? Is he smoking? Is he doing some illegal thing? We are all extremely worried about our children. We are extremely worried about our loved ones. Are they in anxiety? Are they in depression? Are they going through serious mental illness? Now that brings a very interesting subject. When we talk of anxiety, depression, anger, rage, are all of these psychological disorders? Are all of these a mental illness? What is behind it? It's the biggest human computer ever made. The World Health recognizes, this is the official uh, definition, state of mind in which an individual is able to realize his or her own abilities, cope up with the normal stresses of life. If you are not able to do the work that your boss has given you, you get into anxiety and depression. So if you are not able to cope up with what you are used to, that also is part of the definition. You can work fruitfully and productively and you are able to make a contribution to society. What we are all doing here is we are trying to make a contribution to society at large. Let's try to understand, to understand this psychiatry, psychology, let's understand and simplify the brain structure as a whole. Once we understand the infrastructure, the hardware, we will get to understand the software. So as we know, the brain has got certain lobes. One is the, called the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, the cerebellum, and then from the brain we go to the spinal cord. This is the basic structure we all know from our biology classes in school. Now, there is a higher brain. The frontal lobe is called the higher brain. Why? Because this is the part of the brain which uses judgment, understanding, emotions. They all originate from here. How to interact? With person A, the frontal lobe tells me. How to interact with person B, my frontal lobe has taught me. So that is why it is called the highest power of understanding. Now there is a difference. Does the left side of the brain think right the right, right one? No, there is a huge difference. Now this what I show is stands good for people who are right-handed. Reverse may be true for people who are left-handed. So the left, sorry. The left-handed are concerned with, the, uh, the left side of the brain is concerned with logic, math, language, reading, writing, analysis. And the right side, personality, creativity, intuition, music, mm -hmm. art, spatial abilities. I'll just stop here for a minute. I'll tell you one reason. You have heard of people having stroke who become hemiplegic and he can't speak. You'll be surprised to know. If they lose their speech, the damage is on the left side, as I've said, language. But believe me, 
if you ask them to sing they will sing a song and that's how the brain has what we call as plasticity what do you mean by plasticity remember if a part of the brain is damaged once it remains damaged forever but god has given a power in the brain that is called neuroplasticity what does that do this neural network while you lose the speech here this part of the music takes over the language functions so gradually as you see after a year of losing his speech he starts speaking because then this part takes over the music part you tell him to sing he will sing but he can't speak uh, he can speak he will stutter that's the beauty of brain it repairs it doesn't repair but it relays the neural network inside the brain the frontal lobe is this is where the frontal lobe is it's in, involved in memory functions emotions decision making personality and broca's area is the one which is concerned with speech the speech is not only talking it's vocabulary it's grammar it's the tenor it's the tone it's the reading it's the writing there are certain supposing you get a stroke here you will not be able to name an object you can't say this is called a mic you will say uh, this is a pen okay so these are the damages which happened but the surrounding area will take over the function of this and you can start calling a pen a pen and not a mic as a, as a pen the parietal lobe is required for sensation supposing i touch myself here that is transmitted to the parietal lobe where the function is understood okay this is a soft touch this is a pin prick this is a soft touch so that differentiation occurs in the parietal lobe why i am telling all this is because the the sensations that we get when we are low when we are angry are all integrated here temporal lobe this is a very very important lobe for emotions for anger for memory so this is the one which causes organization and comprehension of language i speak in french you will not understand i make gestures you understand so this is done here now when i say something to you it is processed in this area called the wernicke's area and the wernicke's area transmits it to the front area and that is where the language comes for example you ask me a question where are you from i will say i am from delhi now that question where are you from comes to the wernicke's area and the broca's area tells i am from delhi this is the most important part of the brain which is involved in psychiatry which we call as a psychiatric disease the limbic system get rid of this okay now the limbic system was discovered about 70 80 years ago it has transformed the structures involved in the limbic system has changed it is now actually not a it's an obsolete term now it's called the emotional brain the new terminology is emotional brain now this is where if you split the brain on one side this is the brain you split it this is how it looks so these are the structures which are hypothalamus pituitary gland amygdala and hippocampus they are all processing different types of emotions for example hippocampus is for memory processing you ask me a question this guy this is a computer this is the chip which works and makes us amygdala aggression road rage your amygdala is a problem hypersexuality hyposexuality amygdala is a problem flight and fight what is this i see a snake here i will leave this podium and i'll run my amygdala will process that okay i my somebody brushes my car i'll fight that is my amygdala so this is the area where all these emotions come out hypothalamus is for hunger thirst pleasurable activities temperature i see a snake here i sweat that is done by the hypothalamus i see my boss coming catching me doing a wrong thing i sweat that is done by the hypothalamus now all of this how do they work they work as an orchestra they work as a tandem that is done by another structure this is another view of the limbic system that is by a circuit called the pappus circuit this is a very interesting circuit discovered long back in 
This is the one which is structural, which integrates all of these functions and any disruption in the limbic papist circuit causes a large number of disorders. What are they? It can disturb your sleep, it can cause anger, it can cause you memory loss, it interferes with your dreams, it causes sexual disorders, it causes social cognitive damage. Now what is social cognitive damage? You have heard the term autism. What does an autistic child do? He avoids looking at your eye to eye contact is gone. He doesn't interplay with others. All that damage happens here. The papist circuit and the limbic system is damaged. So the child avoids looking at the parents. No eye to eye contact. So that social cognition is damaged when there is a damage here. When any little damage during birth, during while the child is in utero, some infection to the mother, some toxic drugs that the mother has taken, some infection that the mother has taken. So all that damages can happen and you can have an autistic child. So functions are this. It is an integration of all these senses that we have, emotional behavior and motivation. I'm sorry. So now what all can happen? There are certain disorders which are specific, which presents as psychiatric, but they are not psychiatric disorders. The manifestation is, so for example, depression, anxiety, anger, abnormal behavior, not sleeping, they are like fever. They appear like fever, but you can have fever because of viral fever, you can have due to dengue, you can have malaria. So depression and all these psychiatric symptoms are due to a particular disease. And that is what our job comes in. So you can have if an eye hypo, sorry. So all of this disorder which I have written, Kluver-Bussy syndrome, anxiety, panic. Now you will ask me what is Kluver-Bussy syndrome. Kluver-Bussy syndrome happens when the amygdala is damaged. So you have hyper orality. The person does moves the lips, the mouth all the time. Fiddles with his genitalia or her genitalia. A young 12 year old boy suddenly starts fiddling with his genitalia. That is a Kluver-Bussy syndrome. It is because of any kind of damage that has happened to the amygdala. It can be a stroke. It can be a trauma, it can be an infection, it can be a demyelinating lesion which has extended there, or it can be a toxic insult. Hyperlimbic, you can have mania, OCDs and all because of this. Now the question is, are brain and mind the same thing? This discussion happened for last one and a half hours. Some part of it. Mm. Are they different? Where is the mind? Where is that located? Is it located in the galaxy? Is it located in the heart? Is it located in the brain? Where is this mind located? It's all in that circuit. The limbic system, the papist circuit, controlled further by the frontal lobe. This is my knowledge, which is very, very little. Believe in me, I don't know anything about it. But there is a clear association, merging of mind and brain at all times. They cannot be seen isolated. There is a constant. Now, this is the Tasmanian Sea and the Pacific Ocean, which is merging. The color is different. It is, it is actually a fantastic thing. This is actually, this is a photograph which is well known. So, the brain and mind, they look different, but they are actually one of the same thing. We don't have all the answers. So, mera dil baitha ja raha hai. Mera dil mein bhoat chot lagi hai. My heart is sinking. All these songs we have heard when we were young. It has nothing to do with the heart. It's all to do with the mind or the brain if I may use it. And the distance is quite a bit. It's 14 inches. Now to this extent, scientific work has been done. The British Medical Journal, which is an extremely peer-reviewed, well-known journal, has published Time to End the Distinction Between Mental and Neurological Illness. It is a published article. And there are a huge number. I don't want to quote all of them. Large number which says it is absolutely foolhardiness to distinguish that this is a mental illness, this is a neurological illness. They are part of the same continuum, they are part of the same spectrum. You need to identify at which end of the spectrum is there. I cannot touch all the neurological disorders which, manif which manifest with psychiatric manifestations. I will touch some common, some common ones like dementia, Parkinson's and a few more which I want to introduce. 
impairment in intellectual function affecting more than one cognitive domain. So what does this mean? One more than one cognitive domain. Supposing I only lose my memory, I am not demented. But if I lose my memory, and if I lose one skill which I knew, then possibly I am developing dementia. Alone, one single domain is not sufficient. So multiple, suppose I have become disoriented. I have lost my short term memory and I have become disoriented. I can't recognize my close ones. Or I can't recognize this is a kitchen or a washroom. Then, and as well as I am losing memory, then it is a sign of dementia. And it never happens suddenly. It happens gradually. Suddenly if it happens, it's a different cause. It's never a dementia. Now these very important thing to understand when your family member is losing memory, family member is not understanding, family member is behaving abnormally, there are huge number of reversible causes. Our sacrosanct job is to identify them and reverse them. All of them need not be condemned as degenerative incurable disease. I'll just touch upon them. Kidney disease, thyroid disease, liver disease, B12 deficiency, obstructive sleep apnea, con consume, consumption of toxins. Obstructive sleep apnea is your partner snores whole night and he's drowsy the next morning. He will have short term memory, he will be disoriented once in a while. It doesn't mean he's got dementia, it's completely correctable and reversible disease. He's got trauma or a tumor or a multiple sclerosis or syphilis or a normal pressure hydrocephalus where the water increases in the brain, he will also behave like a demented patient, but completely curable, treatable, reversible. Similarly, alcohol, drugs, drug induced. Now I'll give you an example. I get many patients who are treated by my fellow gastroenterologist with a drug called levosulprite because it prevents the vomiting part of it. They can, ha ha, my vomiting theek ho gaya. But the family members noted that this guy has become slow. This guy has become, he doesn't know what he's talking. His vomiting has stopped. Levosulprite induces Parkinsonism. And because of that, he gets depression. So the guy has been roaming about the countryside. Why are you depressed? Why are you so slow? Ho gaya? The reason is that drug. So you have to show your drug list to the person who's treating you to understand that some of the drugs that we take in our normal lives can cause depression, can cause slowness, can cause features which are Parkinsonism and including dementia. So one has to have a continuous knowledge. It, you cannot isolate the patient and treat, okay, this is my gastroenterology, this is my neurology. You have to have an interplay, otherwise things don't work good. Now what we understand is dementia, these four, big four, they are degenerative disease. There is no cure for them. They are the Alzheimer's, vascular, Lew body and frontotemporal. Now these are called the primary degenerative, of which Alzheimer's type disease is one of the big ones. I'll just touch upon it. There is a condition called mild cognitive impairment. This is a precursor for getting dementia. You know, you start noticing your spouse or your family or your loved ones forgetting keys. He for, forgot to switch off the uh, ignition. He forgot to switch off the AC. He forgot to switch off the... If it happens in a repetitive repetitive manner, it is mild, in, mild cognitive impairment. It could be a precursor of a dementia. That is why you have to take note of this and bring it to the notice of your caretaker. Now, what is Alzheimer's disease? Basically, the neural structures, the neural filaments, an abnormal protein is produced by the brain for reasons still not clear. And that protein goes and disrupts the neural network. And it preferentially affects certain part of the brain. As a result, you lose your memory, your orientation, your understanding of things. And as it, as the deposition goes on and on and on, you lose your self. Now, can I have that video? I'm sorry, this is technological handicap. <laughs> this. This is from Uttarakhand.
share a good news about Alzheimer's disease. Model for Alzheimer's disease has been created in mouse and rats. So these proteins, these abnormal protein deposition which happens, it's an immunological disorder. And we have antibodies which have removed these from the rats. And the rats which were slowed down because of the model in the Alzheimer's disease, after giving the antibodies, they've started moving about and roaming about and making interesting like eating food, etc. I think in the next 10 years, this would be a treatable disorder, if not in the next five years. So this is hope for those who have in the family, anybody. So the risk, what are the risk factors? Age is a risk factor. The older you grow, the more chance of you having this. If you have MCI before that, it's a risk factor. Now this is a test that we can do, APOF positivity which we can do. We can even do a PET CT of the brain and say that this person may develop later on. Vascular less, low education, female, unfortunately, they take the brunt here also. Well, I will, uh, for the interest of time, I will not go into repetition. But they can be depressed, they can have hallucinations, they can have sleep wake and sun dawning. As the, moment, as the sun goes down, they become more agitated. So now this is what a healthy brain looks and this is what an Alzheimer's disease brain looks like. If we do a biopsy of the brain. So this much change happens. The second topic I thought in my mind was Parkinsonism. Very large number of family members have Parkinsonism. I thought I'll just touch it. So these are the features of Parkinsonism. And they happen slowly. They never happen suddenly. So you become masked facial expression. So supposing like I'm talking now, I'm a little agitated, I'm anxious, not depressed. If I become like this, that is mask-like appearance. In fact, most of us diagnose the patient the moment he enters the office. Stooped posture, rigidity, fixed elbows. These arms don't swing when he walks. Forward tilt, slightly flexed hips and knees, shuffling gates, he walks like this. Trembling of extremities. These are the hallmark characteristics of Parkinsonism. Advanced. So what happens in Parkinsonism? There is a, this is a part of the brain, they call the brain stem. Now these neurons, dopamine neurons become less. These cells die. You can see here, become less. You develop these features. So we artificially try to give Sindopa, Eldopa and all these drugs with their own side effects because we are incapable of giving dopamine here. We give dopamine by the mouth, it goes all over the body and creates its own problems. Psychiatric disorders are extremely common in Parkinson's patients, up to the extent of 85%. They can have anxiety, they can have hallucinations, they can have depression, they can have delusions, and some of them have suicidal thoughts. What causes this? It could be the disease per se, even the drugs which are given for Parkinsonism can also cause these problems. Dopamine, excess of dopamine can cause excitement, can cause hallucinations. At night, they run away from home. So you have to have a very balanced approach in treating these patients. And believe me, the disease is incurable as of today. We only treat the symptoms, we don't treat the disease. So I'll not go into this, this is boring. Major depression is about 25% and up to 50% have some kind of depression. So how do you recognize this? Diminished interest in usual activities, like not reading the newspaper, not going for a walk. Reduced enjoyment of his usual. He doesn't enjoy his food anymore. Excessive guilt. Oh, oh, I didn't save enough for you. I don't know what will happen to the children. Lack of motivation energy. Daddy, nahalo. Not interested. 
he used to read the paper for one hour, now he reads it for one minute. Reduced libido, poor appetite, disrupted sleep, thoughts of death and death. Can I play this video? Can I play this video? I'll show two interesting videos of my patients. This I've taken their permission. <laughs> He's moving about that because of excess of drugs. Sorry, this is again technology challenging. As he speaks about it, he cries and his handshake increases. Most anxiety and depressive disorders can be treated in Parkinson's disease. And we treat them. And they do very well, most of them. Multiple sclerosis is an extremely common disorder in young patient people affects a large number of them. This is my subject of interest as well. And believe in me, 40 to 50 percent of young people are extremely depressed. Unfortunately, I don't want to play this video because of the technological hassles. Not only they have the limbs not moving, the bladders not moving, the other functions not happening, but they are depressed. And these are young women who are depressed, young men who are depressed in the productive 